I think as we all know, um, suicide is one of the most difficult and, and heartbreaking topics to try to grapple with. And um, a recent study published in the prestigious journal JAMA Psychiatry, authored by some of our panelists here tonight, showed that Muslims in the United States have higher rates of suicide attempts than adults from other American faith groups. This study was based on data collected through ISPU's annual American Muslim Poll. This is an annual survey. And the data that uh, contributed to this article was fielded throughout the month of January in 2019. So it was actually um, just pre-pandemic, right? Uh, it was definitely pre-pandemic. Um, and the survey was fielded among a nationally representative survey, uh, a nationally representative sample rather, of American Muslims, as well as a sample of the general American public. If you want any further details on the methodology, um, I will uh, drop a link into the chat so that you can see the, the methodology um, with all of its details. These results, which we'll talk about in a minute, have sparked a great deal of conversation, some confusion, and rightly, uh, a lot of concern. And today, we're, we're going to discuss this important issue with those who authored the study, some of the leading experts in this field. I do want to mention that this research um, was not solely an academic exercise. On the contrary, the authors and panelists that you're gonna hear from tonight, yes, they're academics and researchers, but they're also clinicians and public health practitioners. Clinicians who see patients with mental health challenges every day, or people who oversee public health and for whom this type of data is really, really vital in their ability to effectively support not just their clients, but our communities. So without further ado, I want to briefly introduce you to our amazing um, set of speakers here tonight. They really are experts in this field, and I'm so um, interested in learning from them uh, here tonight. So let me first introduce you to Dr. Rania Awad. She is the Clinical Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the Stanford University School of Medicine, where she's also the director of the Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab and its community nonprofit, maristan.org. She's also the Associate Chief of the Division of Public Mental Health and Population Sciences and the Co-Chief of the Diversity and Cultural Mental Health Section at Stanford. Prior to studying medicine, she also pursued classical Islamic studies in Syria and holds certifications in the Quran, Islamic law, and other branches of the Islamic sciences. So welcome, Dr. Rania Awad. We also have Dr. Hamada Hamid Al-Talib. He is the Associate Professor of Psychiatry, Neurology, and Public Health at Yale University. He is an epidemiologist whose research focuses on mental health and neuropsychiatry. He's authored more than 50 academic publications in the field of neuropsychiatry and is the chief editor of the Journal of Muslim Mental Health. He's also the president of the Institute of Muslim Mental Health, and he's dedicated much of his work focuses, focused on training mental health professionals about the needs of Muslim communities. In addition to this academic work, he provides direct clinical care for complex neuropsychiatric illnesses um, at, in the Yale University and VA healthcare systems. So welcome, Dr. Hamada. Uh, we also have Bilal Zia, who's a PhD candidate in clinical psychology, and he holds a master's degree in clinical psychology from the University of Manitoba. He's been researching issues related to Muslim mental health for more than five years, including topics related to suicide. He previously served as the co-lead for the Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab's suicide response team, and he's the co-creator of Maristan's suicide training program for Muslim community and religious leaders. Welcome, so welcome, Bilal. And last but definitely not least, we have Ebony Jackson Shahid, also known as Bayan. Um, she is the director of public health for the largest city in Connecticut. She has an MPH in epidemiology from SUNY, and she completed a postgraduate fellowship at the Yale School of Medicine in neurology. She also has clinic ex experience as a behavioral analyst, as a behavior analyst, and she has research experience having served as a junior epidemiologist at the VA in West Haven, Connecticut, and at Yale Epilepsy Research Center. Uh, welcome, Bayan. 
So thank you all uh, so much. I want to start um, this discussion with Dr. Rania. Uh, Dr. Rania, can you tell us a little bit about why you and your co-authors embarked on this study? Why was it important to look at this? Thank you so much, Mary, and welcome everybody. Um, I first wanted to just make sure that I let everybody know here that you're very welcome to be here. And before we really dive in any further, I also just wanted to let you know that the conversation may be heavy tonight. And so for that, I want to just make sure that everyone here knows that if they need to take a moment to step back or even just you know, leave and if they feel they can come back to come back because the topic is about suicide and it is a difficult one. And I guess that's a great place to start, Mary. Why is it exactly that we decided to do this work? So I'll begin first, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, by saying that, you know, the group of us here that were introduced, my very um, esteemed co-panelists and also who are my co-authors actually in this study, we decided to do this work, as you said earlier, not as an academic exercise, but rather it was really to figure out what we were seeing clinically and anecdotally in the work we were doing in the Muslim community. So for me, this is not, and I want to emphasize this because I know it's been on people's minds, why publish something that actually shows the Muslim community in potentially a negative light? And that, of course, is not the intention in any way. Rather, it's because we were seeing in actual clinical practice, I'm a psychiatrist, for example, and have been the clinical director of, of clinics in which are predominantly for Muslims in mental health. And what we were seeing you know, year after year was really an increase in suicide attempts and in people talking about suicide actually being a very potential uh, way out for them. And this is not, for anyone who's listening to this and thinking to themselves, well, isn't that something that's, you know, haram in Islam, it's not something that's permissible, why is this even a point of conversation? You know, the religious belief system, which of course we're not going to delve into today's discussion per se, is not always, um, does not always translate into Muslims themselves not feeling suicidal or attempting suicide, which is actually what we were finding. So I'll tell you for me personally, what prompted this, um, a very large clinic that dealt, dealt with Muslim uh, mental health that I was part of, you know, the, what we were finding in the data we collected from thousands, literally thousands of Muslims, was that one in three Muslims who came to the clinic said that in the two weeks prior to coming for actual help, clinical help, that they had suicidal ideation, meaning suicidal thinking. And when you look closer at those numbers, it actually looked as though, it actually not looked as though, it actually was such that people who had considered dying by suicide had actually some, a much smaller number, thankfully, had attempted actually suicide. And there were those who had what we call a death wish, kind of a, a wish I was no longer here and alive, over 50%. So those numbers were very high. And this is what we call clinical data, as in to say people coming into the clinic and what we're observing as clinicians. In order to really figure out, was this really accurate across the US or was this only really for those who are coming in and seeking out mental health support is why we actually decided to partner with the ISPU, the Institute of Social Policy and Understanding, which puts out, of course, every year, something called the Muslim Poll, the annual Muslim Poll, which is a cross-sectional, meaning it goes across the U.S. and across different populations, and not just looking at Muslim populations, but actually comparative data that goes through all these different faith groups, Christians, Jews, atheists, agnostics, Hindus, Buddhists. The reason we were interested to look at the American Muslim population in comparison to other American communities was to really figure out how were we doing, were the numbers and data we were seeing in our clinics similar to other faith groups? Was this more of an issue, a spike? Was it because in the last many years, things have been really difficult for the Muslim community? What was actually happening? So really to get a pulse, we decided to put these questions and I'll be the first to say, and I know that my, my esteemed panels will go into this much deeper, that they'll talk about the limitations of our study, but we just needed to get a sense of what was happening. And that is why we decided to do this particular study. We didn't we expected the larger numbers because we saw things clinically and anecdotally that would prove this anyway, but we certainly didn't expect exactly what we found. And this is why we really needed to do this study because we needed to start somewhere. And I can't emphasize enough how this is just a first step 
in really figuring out a whole lot more and a whole lot more research and data that needs to be collected and studied in more detail to really come up with a more comprehensive story about what exactly is happening here in U.S. Muslim populations. Thank you so much, Dr. Rania. It, it really is sobering to hear um, not only the, the the sort of anecdotes, but the numbers that, that you do have. And I know that the, the data from this study was really sobering. So I wanna ask Dr. Hamada if you can actually tell, uh, tell the audience a little bit about the results from this study and how we might be able to understand them. Sure. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, I think it's fitting that we 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 start we always start with you know in the name of Allah most uh, compassionate and merciful and that really hopefully sets the tone for us that it's a very tough topic it's it's sobering uh, as Dr. Rania alluded to uh, and in addition to us you know dealing with this clinically and academically many of us are dealing with this personally with friends and family even within the panel and so um, when we discuss this let's let's keep in the tone of compassion and Rahman and mercy as we, as some of this is difficult and triggering uh, for, for, for many of us. Uh, and so to kind of discuss the, the nature of the data and the nature of the, of the research. So one of the, the important uh, factor that sets this study apart from much of the other research that's done in the American Muslim community is that it was a national survey. Much, much of the research that's done with the American Muslim community is what we call a convenience sample. In other words, we, we want to learn about this community. Where do we go? We go where Muslims are, such as masajid, mosques, uh, Muslim organizations. And so we go to listservs, MSAs, uh, membership organizations, and ask them, what's your experiences? What's your opinion about X, Y, and Z issue? What's unique about this is ISPU in their, in their national poll are cold calling uh, people across faiths, asking them what your faith is, and then getting information. So this is really important because we don't have the same selection bias of having more religious or more um, or Muslims who are more kind of openly or actively Muslim. So that, that's, a, that's a strength of the study, is that it's much more representative of the, the general American Muslim community. But as with any study, there's limitations. And one of the limitations is that in spite of surveying over 800 Muslims, and this is all done by phone interview, there's only 800 Muslims. And certainly that does not represent, 800 Muslims cannot possibly represent the entire uh, you know, landscape or fabric of the American Muslim community. It's just a sample. It's literally a sample. Uh, and so there's that limitation. And in fact, from a suicide research perspective, we oftentimes in epidemiology report suicide rates in the unit of per thousand people. In other words, you know, six per thousand people, or we don't talk about it, like percentages per hundred people. But because suicide itself is a relatively rare event in terms of deaths of suicide, oftentimes that's the unit. And so we only had 800 people. And even within that, that those groups, obviously you have only a subset that's, let's say African-American or um, Arab or South Asian. And so and comparing those subgroups is, is limited because of the, the numbers. So that's one limitation. The other limitation is, you know, this was a poll. It wasn't, a, it wasn't designed for a mental health study. And so the details of people's mental health situation, we don't have. So we didn't ask people, do you have a history of depression or anxiety, or are you actively drinking alcohol? We didn't ask that depth, those, those, uh, those specific issues. And so, so we don't know what role. We know from the general literature that that is a major factor uh, in terms of risk for suicide, but we don't know that about this population. And it could be that our sample happened to have a lot of people with severe mental illness. Uh, we don't know that. And so this is an important study because it really bring, br brings our attention to uh, this important, this very important and serious problem, and it will ins hopefully inspire the community to to mobilize resources and think about it more deeply, and and develop interventions as a community to prevent this and deal with this. And as Dr. Rania said, all of us on this panel and, and our colleagues are already dealing with it. We already see it clinically, and we see it in our communities. 
uh, but this kind of gives you a broader uh, perspective. Uh, so I guess I'll, I'll stop there and then. Um, Dr. Talada, can I just ask one follow-up question? Thank you so much for outlining all of that. Can you talk just briefly about the the actual data that you, what did you find um, through this methodology? What sure. what did the data tell you? Sure. The, the, I think the, the take home uh, message is that when we surveyed by 800 people, uh, Muslims, around 8%, almost 8% reported, they tried to kill themselves sometime in their life. And I, I would just pause there. I mean, that is a astronomical number that almost one out of 10, if you're in a room with 10 people, one of them with Muslims, if you're in a masjid, for instance, for Sata Juma, uh, and there's a couple hundred people, you know, there's several people in that masjid that probably try to kill themselves sometime in their life. This is very, very concerning and that's very scary. Now, um, so that, that's the take home message. The, the, where it got controversial is kind of that, what, and where the media really picked up on it is when we compare different groups, there's different ways statistically to compare. So when we looked at, if you look at just number of people who reported, around 8% of Muslims reported that they were suicide, the suicide that they tried to kill themselves sometime in their life. And um, around 6%, 4 to 6% across the other groups reported that they try to kill themselves sometime in their life, anywhere than three to six percent, depending on the group. And so the question is, from statistically, the raw numbers are, suggest that the Muslims uh, uh, reported it at a higher uh, proportion than their groups. But is that from random chance or is that, um, is that a real number? And so one uh, statistical analysis we did, we found that there wasn't a difference, that there was random chance. In other words, if you flip a, co a coin 100 times, you, you know, we know that the odds of getting heads and tails is 50%. But maybe out of random chance, you might hit you know, 45 heads and uh, you know, 35 uh, tails, for instance. Um, and so th this is random chance that you might not get exactly 50-50, even though the probability is 50-50. As the same thing with this, with any statistic or any survey, maybe the, that difference in, in 8% versus 6% or 8% versus 4% is this random chance. Uh, and so when we controlled for every factor such as social economic class, education, race, gender, then that's when the Muslim, when controlling for all those factors, it looked like the Muslims were at higher risk uh, as much as double the risk of reporting uh, having tried to kill themselves. Now, again, this is, this is one study. This is a sample. This is not the truth of the capital T. And so I don't think that's the take-home message. I think the take-home message is that this is a real serious issue that is not a, a marginal uh, or, or a rare event. Uh, it's actually quite serious, and we need to take it seriously. Uh, larger studies need to be done. Um, we need to do actually more in-depth statistical analysis. Uh, because this was such a... Um, striking finding, uh, we, we thought it was important to report these kind of preliminary findings, the, the major finding, which is the 8%, at a high uh, impact journal such that we get attention from stakeholders, from public health, health experts, from mental health departments, from the community, from community leadership, so we can have these conversations. And then we will continue to analyze and see if there's any particular group uh, that is in particular risk. And certainly this will help us think about what's the next study to see A, where we need to focus our efforts and energy to, in terms of preventing suicide and B, kind of developing uh, programs such as what Marisan is doing in terms of training uh, community leaders, uh, imams, so forth and so on to deal with this um, tragic situation. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamada. Um, Clearly, this has enormous implications for all of us as individuals and families. Um, and I want to back up and see, look at the bigger, the, the big picture for a second, and and ask Bayan, you know, in your capacity as a public health leader in a large city, um, what do you think the the public health and the policy implications of these findings are? Where do we go from here when it comes to sort of community health? and policy.
Assalamu alaikum everyone. How's everyone this evening? Um, so I think I just want to start with uh, discussing exactly what the role of public health is, because I think people um, don't really know what public health, health is and uh, how it benefits societies. So I think public health, um, it promotes the welfare uh, of the entire population. Uh, public health officials have been you know, given this task of protecting populations by preventing disease, um, improving the quality of life through organized efforts, programming, education, and enforcement. Um, and I think that people really need to understand that that's what public health is. Um, what is the role of public health in addressing suicide specifically? Um, really, we need to learn more about what suicide is. We need to learn uh, what the disease is or the condition, just like any other um, disease in, in society. What is it? How it affects individuals? Um, how is it diagnosed? How is it treated? Um, how is it prevented? So studies like this are actually helping public health officials um, with diseases in community. We need to collect data and surveil um, suicide, find out uh, the vulnerable population, um, who, it, who is it, and what are the risk factors, analyze the data, uh, communicate to stakeholders um, what the population's illnesses, what are potential threats uh, to the population. And when I mean stakeholders, I'm talking about um, hospitals, nonprofit and profit organizations, uh, local health departments, uh, universities, et cetera. And then you need to um, basically discuss prevention and programming. In terms of policies um, and, and how they contribute Basically, in doing this work, uh, the study has fostered and I think brought awareness uh, to the condition, uh, suicide, uh, to the community. And public policy can further create things like regulatory measures, uh, civil statutes, um, help delegate requirements and mandates, uh, protecting, you know, populations at risk, foster direct support, and create further opportunities and incentives for further research. Um, health policy can impact programs and services that influence our physical, social, and our economic environments, um, and also um, impact the health behaviors of the community and the clinical care. So honestly, I, I just wanted to say, you know, from a personal point of view, um, that I hope that this research and continued research uh, will force the Muslim community to look at mental illness as a legitimate disease um, and not just a personal choice. Um, I really hope that it fosters leaders to uh, destigmatize individuals that are affected by many mental health disorders uh, that can lead to suicidal behavior. Um, I'm hoping that the Muslim community understands that there are drivers of health that can lead to this behavior. And through this work, we are helping to identify uh, what some of those health drivers and risks, as well as social determinants, uh, are. And that this work is going to assist in creating intervention programs uh, that benefit the community at large. And I just want to say that, you know, a healthier community is a thriving community. And that's definitely something, um, a take home that I think, you know, I hope everyone takes from this discussion. Thank you so much, Fayan. I'm so happy to know that there are people like you in leadership positions um, doing this really important work um, and that this data is helpful for elevating this, this conversation to the importance that it, that it should have. Um, I want to go back to the data a little bit. I know that Dr. Hamada talked a little bit about the limitations and um, some of the questions around why uh, higher rates of attempted suicide might have been seen. And I was wondering, Bilal, if there was anything you could add. I know that some people have wondered whether the results, um, you know, these, these alarmingly high rates uh, maybe reflect 
Muslim demographics just generally, we know from our research at ISPU, from the American Muslim Surveys and other research that we've done, that Muslims are more likely to be young. Uh, it's a very young community when you look at the American faith landscape. And the Muslim community also has higher rates of poverty than other American faith groups that we've studied. Um, so there have been some questions about whether these uh, the suicide data perhaps reflects those demographics. Can you talk a little bit about that um, and add uh, to what Dr. Hamada was, was discussing related to this? Yeah, thank you for the question. And assalamu alaikum, everyone. I um, uh, appreciate everyone uh, taking the time on, on a Sunday evening to be here uh, and joining us for this. Uh, really tough, but really important conversation. Um, to answer your question, it, it's really, it, it really is kind of challenging to go there necessarily. Uh, and the reason for that is when it comes to suicide in the Muslim community, there just isn't a lot of research uh, when it comes to suicide, specifically in the Western Muslim populations or, uh, or American Muslim community specifically, there's even less research. Um, so we can borrow from other research literature and look at sort of the general American population and general global populations. Um, and what we know in those populations is that youth do have higher rates of suicide attempt than adults, uh, but it's actually adults and older adults who have the gener uh, generally have the highest rates of actual uh, deaths by suicide. Um, so I, I think one of the common misconceptions that I often hear uh, when we're working in suicide is, you know, we must be worried about the youth uh, only because the youth are the folks um, who will be the, at the highest risk. Uh, and, and I, I want to point out that that may not be the case, that there may be uh, other populations. And in fact, there are other populations uh, who are just as equally at risk or maybe more at risk uh, than the youth as well. So, so that's something to consider. Um, but for our research, uh, generally at this stage, because there's not a, a lot of research out there, uh, we came at it with a really broad focus. And really the broad focus was asking the question, do American Muslims uh, report more or less suicide attempts uh, than other religious groups in America? And to answer this question, we essentially applied some statistical controls like Dr. Hamada was talking about um, to remove the effects of demographic variables, things like age, uh, gender, economic status, race, and other factors. So we're essentially controlling from them, removing them from the equation. Um, so in a, in a nutshell, uh, the results that we presented in our paper conclude that Muslims do report suicide attempts uh, at a higher rate than other religious groups. Uh, and these are data that are essentially adjusting for the demographic factors. Um, so again, that's not saying that younger people or older people or those who are struggling with poverty or specific racialized groups within the Muslim community um, uh, are at greater risk or a lesser risk. It's just saying at this stage, it's hard to tell. Uh, and like Dr. Hamad has pointed out and Dr. Rani has pointed out and, and Bayan has pointed out as well, uh, we need to do a lot more finer uh, detailed research to really elucidate what is going on in the data. Um, and, and, you know, there are models that uh, inshallah we're looking at doing uh, to really get a sense of that uh, a little bit better. Um, but inshallah that research will, will be for, uh, for a little bit down the road in the future. Great, thank you so much, Bilal. Um, I want to uh, turn now, and I promise we'll get to, I, we're getting some great questions coming in, some really important questions, so keep putting your questions in the Q&A box. Um, I promise we'll get to those very shortly. Before we do, I just want to ask um, two questions, sort of the so what, now what question. So the first thing is, you know, given this alarming data, uh, and this is directed to you, Dr. Hamada, um, given this alarming data and, and the real and, and you know, terrible impact that suicide has uh, and suicidal ideation has on individuals and also on families. What, what can we do? What does the best science tell us about ways to prevent suicide and build resilience? Sure. Um, the, the, the nuance or the complication to the complicated way of thinking about this question is who is we? When we say we as a society, and so there's certain societal issues such as structural violence, um, you know, access to care, uh, you know how you know, um, you know racism, economic oppression. You know, there's kind of big issues that drive you know ment mental illness uh, and uh, and even people to be suicidal. So those kind of the, the, the big macro issues. There's kind of what we call the measles issues, which is more at a community level. 
And so how uh, are our centers, are either our masajid, our mosques, or our third spaces trying to help people with mental illness? What kind of, re- there are many masajid, there's many community centers who have, for instance, a social worker or a, a counselor or youth counselor that try to address this uh, right there in the front lines. So there's kind of a measle level as a community, what can we do to help support um, whether, whether it's our youth or our, the members of our community or, or our elders. So that's kind of the measle level. Then at, at a micro level, in terms of our own, indiv- as individuals, as families, there's kind of things we can do, uh, there's very tangible, concrete things we can do to ho- hopefully prevent that. And uh, some of it's very cliche, as such as stuff such as diet and exercise uh, and keep, you know, be having healthy diet, watching caffeine, what you ingest, you know, substances such as, you know, whether it's weed or alcohol or so forth and so on. Exercise, you know, as your stress hormones go up, your, it drives you to eat more carbs and, um, you, know, they're, they're, you know, that leads to heart disease, so forth and so on, uh, and it affects mood uh, and as well as your sleep. Uh, as you exercise more, especially cardiovascular exercise, uh, that metabolizes your stress hormones. So that is very helpful. And then, you know, of course, as Muslims, with the spiritual component and being particularly like mindful and reflective and having techniques of, of um, reflecting on the deen and uh, engaging in, in the community. Uh, certainly that's part of it. Uh, the other part is support. So part of the support, is, so we talked about the basics, diet and exercise and the, the spiritual perspective, there's seeking support. So seeking support is if you're feeling stressed, uh, if you're feeling a little overwhelmed, burning, burning out from work, so forth and so on, uh, where do you get help? Support from family members, asking family members, going to therapy, uh, finding a therapist, a counselor, which is still quite taboo in some um, some subgroups within our community. But we, we are six to 10 mo- million Muslims in this country, and there's trillions of dollars of resources uh, for, for healthcare, including mental health care. We shouldn't, this is not only our problem, we're not on an island. And so we really should use the resources available to us from public health, the public health system, including mental health system. And so seeking support uh, is very important for our community and, and individuals, and then providing support. And so whether you're a parent or just you know, a, a member of the community, provide support in a, in a non-judgmental way, way. Be more curious and prescript, prescriptive. Don't just give advice, but ask people like, what's going on? How's, how are things going? Uh, and how can I help you? And, how, how, you know, and really reach out to people. So that's how I'd kind of summarize kind of things we can do. We talked about macro, meso, individual, individual, diet, exercise, you know, the, the spirituality, uh, support, and even developing the language. Just get, talking, you know, one thing we're not very good at um, is just talking about uh, emotions. I, whenever you say, you know, how are you? Kif halek, everybody says, fine, good, alhamdulillah. And, and we do we have much, we don't use emotional language. I actually learned that um, from the Muslim, uh, the, the Black Muslim Psychology Conference. We, they, one of the things I, take, I took home from that conference is how Muslims we use, we, we, we lack um, that emotional language in our day to day. And so we should start um, shifting that culture and use emotional language and express kind of our needs to our loved ones and to our support systems. Great, and, and Dr. Rania, I want to close the discussion uh, portion out before we answer uh, some audience questions with, with you. Um, you know, what, what now? So we, we see this concerning data. We've talked a little bit about the policy implications and, and sort of public health implications, and then some ideas about how uh, we can deal with, with this issue. Um, but what, what else is being done uh, now that we know some something more, now that we know these results, what is being done about this? What further is being done? Absolutely. And I think that's really the right way to think about this because this entire conversation we've been having tonight is, I can't emphasize enough how much it's a really a starting point. I believe it was Bilal who said earlier, there's very little data about the, about the topic of Muslims and suicide, particularly when we look at Western Muslims if we look at the U.S., which is our population we're talking about today, since that has been the focus of our study, even 
less so. And so for that reason, I want to say that there's a number of things that we ourselves, this group here is really dedicated to making sure we do. I'm going to just mention again, I know we mentioned it before, but this work was really a partnership, a partnership between the Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab and the researchers like myself, Bilal, who's here tonight, Dr. Osama, who's not here, but was with us in the study. And then of course, Dr. Hamada, who is at Yale and the Institute of Muslim Mental Health, where he, Mihir and Bayan had worked together at Yale. And then of course, you know, Sister Dania, who's not with us tonight, Mugahed and yourself, Mayara from the ISPU, the Institute of Social Policy and Understanding. Why am I mentioning all of this? Because it takes a collaborative effort to really make sure we're looking at this properly and looking at it from so many different lenses and different types of disciplines. Now, in terms of next steps, I can tell you that this group here is dedicated to making sure we figure out follow-up steps. So one of the first things we intend on doing is figuring out, well, the data was from 2019 pre-pandemic. What's happened since? Because subhanAllah, we have no idea actually if things even got even worse perhaps after the pandemic, because we know in general, mental health of all people after the pandemic has really taken a hit. So for all we know, this could actually be even more of a, a problematic number, or it could be like some of the other data we have in the lab that actually says that many Muslims turn to faith and really try to cope through faith in the pandemic. Allahu Akbar. we really don't know. So my, my saying all of that is to say that one of the first steps we're planning on doing is follow-up studies figuring out, asking these very same questions again, and asking even deeper questions, because so many people are asking why. We understand the numbers and the percentages now, but why is this the case? So that's our first point. I also want to say that at the lab, at the Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab, alhamdulillah, we were very blessed actually to receive a, an important grant that started just this month. And it's from the Templeton Foundation. For those who are familiar with that foundation, it looks at the intersection between science and religion. And what we're looking at here is what we're calling Islam-inspired preventative measures against suicide. What are the moral and character traits that Islam inspires and protects against suicide? Because I don't want to just deliver bad news. I want to make sure we look at what is it from Islam that's actually preventative and resiliency factors that allows Muslims to actually not die by suicide, even if they have attempted and are survivors of suicide attempts. And even if this is a consideration, what do we do next? So we're pulling this out and literally building out an entire mo model, what we call a psychological model on this topic. And that study is going to run for the next year and a half. So we asked for your du'as for tawfiq in that, you know, for success in that. Now, in terms of very, that's more research, an academic on a more practical, personal day to day. What are we actually doing here? Since I mentioned to you that we, we embarked on this work several years ago, when we started to realize that clinically in our clinics, we were seeing a third of Muslims coming in reporting suicidal ideation and suicidal, some reporting suicidal attempts, very similar to the 8% actually found in this study. We decided to, in the lab, at the Stanford lab, to really put together um, a concerted effort to make sure that we have materials to teach and educate our community. One of the very first steps in suicide prevention is education. It's awareness and education. But there was no manual, like a go-to guidebook on what to do. So the lab actually spent the last three years working on and creating a very up-to-date, um, scientifically evidence-based, research-backed uh, um, guidebook on suicide prevention, suicide intervention, and suicide postvention, which is basically a fancy word to say, what do you do in the unfortunate aftermath after a suicide has happened in a Muslim community? And we took all of that scientific data, but in, this is where it's very unique, we integrated it in with Islamic ethics, Islamic morals, and principles. And that guidebook or manual, inshallah, will be you know, available and made to the public free of charge for everybody to use and download off of our website at maristan.org, inshallah, in due time. And it's nearly 100 pages and heavily cited in order to be able to say, look, this is the cutting edge research on this topic, and this is what you can do. Now, I realize that so many people hear the 100 pages in an academic manual and go, no, nah, that's just too much, right? So what did we do as a step after that? We took that manual and developed off of it training, trainings for communities. So these are different modules that are part of a larger what we call certification training on suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention 
for a Muslim community specifically. And this kind of certification training is what we're calling the 500 Imam campaign. And inshallah, you'll have links here in the chat box very soon for you to be able to take a look at that yourself. The reason we called it that, people wonder why we're calling it 500 Imam campaign. The reason we called it that was because we have this hope that in 2022, next year, that we would have cert trained and certified at least 500 imams, ustadas, religious and community leaders, youth directors, youth leaders. And the goal is, and this is actually a study that came out of the ISPU actually, on how many masajid or mosques are there in the U.S., and it's 3,000 is the, the last count. So our five-year goal at Maristan is actually to train all 3,000 masajid, inshallah, with your support and help in your du'as. The reason we're doing this is because we need to make sure that all of this education isn't just brushed under the topic of suicide, isn't just brushed under the masjid rug. It's actually there. It's discussed. It's part of the prevention and education that we do. And I want to tell you, if you go to the website, the maristan.org, you know, suicide response um, link, which will be here shortly for you, if not already there, it actually, you have a number of things you can already use beyond the certification trainings. For example, we have khutbas prepared for our khutibs of the Friday prayers and sermons that they can download on suicide prevention. And I hope every single person here who does a khutbah or is in touch with their imam or khutib of their Friday prayer that they attend, please give them a copy of this. Please send them the link. It's fully written. And we have one for prevention, we have one for postvention, and we have steps in what do you do in the aftermath of a crisis, and what do you do to prevent suicide. All of these um, materials and trainings and manuals and certifications are there because we believe this is the next step. We have identified an issue in our community, communities with us, right, all these different Muslim communities, and it is not, it, it is indifferent to cultures, to ages, to ethnicities, and even for those who are wondering, our study also showed that it was indifferent to how much a person was religious. And when I, when I realized that's shocking to people to sometimes hear that, and you have to understand, mental illness does not discriminate. And when somebody reaches a point where they do not see the light at the end of the tunnel any further, they might consider suicide as an option, even if they are someone who's actually a practicing Muslim. This is really important to understand. But suicide, and please take, take nothing home from this whole conversation tonight, please take home this one fact, that suicide is 100% preventable. So if we were actually able to do our work in educating and in making awareness and making sure that there was prevention efforts, we could all actually make a really key difference. So I hope that's a, at least the beginning of a conversation. And again, there's so many uh, resources you're able to access on our own website at Maristan, but also in the many other partner organizations that are hoping and adding to this, you know, kind of nascent or beginning work on the topic of suicide and misuse. Thank you, Dr. Rania. It's so helpful to understand where to go from here. And there's clearly so much work being done um, to, to prevent uh, suicide. Um, I'm looking at all the questions and there are a number of questions relating to the very specific and, and unique needs of Muslim communities um, in, in the ways that Muslim communities might be the same or different from other communities. So I'm gonna um, throw you know, this, this sort of larger question out to the panel for anyone who'd like to answer. Um, but the questions really revolve around both uh, from the care side of things, are the psychiatric needs of, of Muslims different from non-Muslims when it comes to suicide? You know, in what ways are, is it the same or different? And is there a difference in efficacy um, when it comes to treatment for Muslims? But then there are also questions on the other side of things from an individual's perspective and some of the challenges that Muslims may face in accessing mental health services and care, uh, both related to stigma and um, maybe not seeking services, but also maybe not finding them. So it's sort of part of the same question, but, but two sides of, of that coin a little bit. Um, so I'd like to throw that out to, to anyone who'd like to, to start to answer that. Sure, maybe, maybe I'll give it a, a, a go. Um, so first thing is, again, it's a complicated question, but I would say that in general, that the, the needs are the same, that the factors that affect people are the same. I mean, we, we are all human. 
the, the difference oftentimes is uh, trust. And do you trust a non-Muslim therapist? Do you trust a non-Muslim psychiatrist? Do you even trust a Muslim psychiatrist? Believe me, there are many Muslims who actually don't trust Muslim mental professionals because they feel that they're going to be either judged by the Muslim mental professional or that somehow that the Muslim mental health professional is less professional and will talk, talk to their spouses or people in the community about them. Uh, and so they actually prefer going to non-Muslim mental professional. So a big factor, a big difference in terms of the, the Muslim needs versus other people is do they trust, and Muslims have plenty of reasons not to trust the system um, uh, and whatnot. Uh, and so the question is, is that's a barrier that Muslims have. I mean, whether it's the Muslim ban or Islamophobia or whatnot, there's many barriers or, um, in terms of access. So one thing is trust. The other thing is understanding. You know, when um, I, mean, I can tell, say, share many anecdotes where a person, you know, just a mental health professional, I mean, they're also human, they're Americans, they might not know anything about Islam. Yeah, I've had one joke I've had among my colleagues is that uh, a therapist colleague of mine asked a Muslim, are you Islam? In other words, are you not, they don't even know the language of, are you Muslim? They say, are you Islam? Um, and so a Muslim having to explain what, whether it's hijab or prayer or whatnot is, might be tiresome and they might not want to have to explain what their deen means to them, what their religion means to them, why they do what they do, um, where they presumably would not have to do that to a Muslim. Of course, that varies. So I think trust and feeling understood are the two major factors that distinguishes the Muslims, American Muslims needs versus the, uh, the general population. I can jump in on the stigma piece, inshallah. Um, you know, there's really interesting findings, um, and these are a couple of different studies that started to show this, but generally speaking, um, Muslims both in America and Canada uh, and in several other Western countries have generally favorable attitudes towards seeking help. So actually, when they think about going to seek help or go, others going to seek help, they generally have this positive idea of, you know what, it, it would be a good thing if I seek help. But for some reason, what there's a disconnect between this idea of help seeking is good versus should I actually seek help? And what we're starting to find is that there is this idea of stigma. So Muslims uh, do believe that if they were to go seek help, others in the community uh, would lo look at them negatively. Others would look at them shamefully. Um, and sort of there's this mentality of you don't spread sort of the family business outside of the family. And so there's this concern that, you know, a therapist will take that information if they're a Muslim therapist and go, you know, spreading it around, you know, uh, Muslim circles or concern that uh, the, the information won't necessarily be confidential, that, you know, you are spreading your family's business out. Um, and it's important to know a couple of things. So the first thing is, um, you know, from my experience, um, working with uh, individuals who have come to treatment, when they end up going and sharing that uh, with other people that they are in treatment, they end up having some fairly good responses. So people don't necessarily shut them down. They don't necessarily say, oh my God, you, you must be crazy. You must be, uh, you know, there must be so much wrong with you. They're usually kind of like, oh, okay, you're in therapy. And then that's that. Uh, the other piece is you don't have to tell anyone uh, if you go to therapy, you can, you can do it quietly. Um, and so you can sort of sidestep that shame piece uh, if, if, it's, if it's a big concern. Um, and, and then the other piece is, when it comes to our communities, one of the things that we have to understand is uh, we often think of therapy as a process where, you know, people will think about it critically and reason through it critically and say, well, you know what, I need treatment, there's this treatment available, and I'll, and I'll go. What the research actually shows is that this process of actually going to therapy isn't really uh, very often a critically thought out process. Uh, often what uh, sort of supports people going to treatment is their friends and family. Uh, and so what will end up happening for most people who have uh, emotional concerns or psychological concerns or concerns about suicide is that they will tell someone beforehand. They will talk to a family member or they'll talk to a friend. Uh, they'll talk to their parents, their, their brothers or sisters um, and folks of that uh, in, in sort of any of their support group. And so that message will come out somewhere that I am struggling. I, I have some problems. And it's important for us as community members to hear that message uh, and hear what's being said, that I need support. 
and then understand our limitations, right? So most people in the community are not suited to responding to suicide, but they are sort of integral members of that uh, help seeking chain. So when you hear someone say, you know, I'm thinking about killing myself or I'd be better off dead, that should be a cue right away, a trigger in, in, in one's mind to say, whoa, this is serious. And have you thought about going to seek treatment? There are treatments available. Uh, and there, that's sort of a way for us to sidestep the stigma in the community. If everyone is talking about the availability of resources, where the resources are, and that it's okay to access the resources as a whole, we'll end up actually uh, communicating this compassionate environment where seeking treatment uh, is not a bad thing. And it actually is a courageous act uh, that should be commended rather than um, uh, looked down upon. Thank I just you. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Diane. Uh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to um, just address the access to care. Um, so I know that a lot of people right away when they're thinking about access to care, immediately uh, mental health, they're assuming that they have to find a, um, a psychiatrist or a mental health uh, counselor immediately, right, to address their issue. But in terms of, of access to here, you, you may be in some cities or towns that may not have social services available to you. So there are other resources. So I know that we have um, a lot of individuals here within Bridgeport and other different urbi, urban epicenters um, where there may not be a social service um, organization. So speaking to any type of healthcare provider, um, going to your primary care physician, um, there are urgent care centers where there are healthcare providers, going to see someone who is a medical healthcare provider is better than not seeing anyone. So, you know, just from a public health standpoint, you know, um, you don't necessarily have to see a mental health care provider immediately um, if you don't have access to one. Uh, most cities and towns do have, however, resources such as uh, urgent care centers and some sort of hospital uh, ER or, or someone that you can talk to before being referred to uh, a, a counselor or a psychiatrist. So just wanted to let people you know, know that there is access somewhere. Thank you, Bayan. That's really, really helpful, uh, concrete um, suggestions. I'm going to move on to another question. Um, we still have uh, quite a few, but I'm sort of grouping them. And um, one set of questions is around protective and compounding factors. Um, it doesn't sound like this study itself look necessarily at that it was beyond the scope of this study, but is there anything we know um, or can surmise about protective and compounding factors? I think the two things that um, keep coming up are number one, is Islamophobia and sort of the unique challenges that Muslims face in America, could that be a compounding factor? And that, that may be different to other faith communities. And could, uh, you know, faith, could, could Islam itself be a protective factor? Um, do we know anything about this and, and sort of what's the thinking around that? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's, uh, it has a very complicated answer. Um, so to, to really understand this, uh, this question and, and the answer to it, we have to really understand a little bit about sort of the, the main theories of suicide right now. Uh, and there are a number of sort of competing theories that are out there in the psychological literature, but all of them have among the components um, two, two sort of important factors. One is a perceived sense of burdensomeness that you feel like a burden to others. Uh, and the other piece is a perceived sense that you don't fit in with others. Uh, now, Islamophobia is sort of uh, a direct sort of most um, observable piece of not fitting in, right? It's an observable piece of the puzzle where you're uh, act, uh, actively hated on. You know, we've seen um, some really heinous attacks against Muslims in the West in the last, uh, in the last few years, uh, you know, where, which really put the Muslim community on edge and signaled to a lot of people that we don't belong. So that can actually be a contributing factor. 
uh, to the sense of, uh, of, of not belonging in the American community, not belonging in the American narrative or the Canadian narrative or, or whatever Western narrative uh, country you're from. So that can actually compound uh, suicide risk for sure. There's not, there's not a lot of studies that, that show that. There's not any studies specifically on suicide that show that. But there are sort of consistent studies on Islamophobia that show that it is related uh, to negative psychological outcomes. It is related to mental health problems. Uh, so that being said, it, direct Islamophobia may not be the actual sort of the worst problem that a lot of uh, a lot of folks face. I think a lot of young adults and a lot of uh, youth uh, and and actually adults uh, in general face the same problem of not necessarily being able to reconcile uh, their identities. Right? There are some uh, some issues um, such as uh, you know consuming alcohol, which are sort of fundamentally irreconcilable. You know, if you're if you are have sort of Western friends, if you're going to university, if you're, um, you know, even in academia and you're, you're going to social gatherings, chances are that you'll be going out for drinks. Right. That's what uh, that's sort of like the the social currency that happens these days. Um, and as a Muslim, you may believe, well, I can't do that. I can't even go out, uh, let alone uh, drink. I can't be in that the presence of alcohol. And so all of a sudden you can find yourself marginalized, socially excluded. Uh, and so a lot of people find themselves that way. And it's this issue of marginalization, this issue of not necessarily fitting in very well, um, uh, that uh, at least I think may be one of the root causes in our community that really we need to look into uh, a lot more. Uh, as for resiliency factors, there are actually quite a few as well, right? Is Islam actually has built into it uh, a number of different mechanisms by which we can become resilient to suicide. There are things like salah, there are things like dhikr. Uh, all of these pieces are, uh, are essentially mindfulness components. And what we know about mindfulness from the psychological literature, rather than maybe the, real, the, the specific Islamic forms of mindfulness, uh, is that these forms of, of practice can actually bring us into contact with hard emotions. Uh, and one of the, the ways that we deal with suicide in therapy and in, and in a person's personal life is to come into contact with your tough emotions and really face them, allow them in. It's actually the avoidance of these hard emotions uh, that can actually compound these issues. So, uh, so Islam offers a lot of different pathways and inshallah in the and the project that dr rania was uh, alluding to the templeton project uh, inshallah we'll be able to to find out a little bit more about how muslims use these resiliency factors uh to actually improve um uh th their their likelihood of, of, of uh being protected from suicide down the line um would anyone else like to add to that or if not i can move on to another question I, I think uh, Bilal summarized that really well. I'll just add one thing in terms of, in addition to the individual practices of dhikr and salah um, and reflection and meditation that Islam offers, also that social network. And whether it's Jum'ah or Eid or whatever, or just activism, connecting to other people across faiths has, has shown to uh, you know, be, be a resilient factor, a protective factor for suicide and, and, and depression, anxiety in general. Thank you, Dr. Hamada. I wanna um, ask a, a sort of related um, but different question. We've talked a lot tonight about suicide before suicide, right? So suicidal ideation, how to, to, to help people um, or help communities. I'd like to ask, um, in the tragic event that a suicide uh, occurs, what is something that you can share about how a family or a community can approach the tragedy of, of a death by suicide, where there, there may be a lot of stigma, um, there may you know, be a lot of questions about the role of faith and all, all kinds of issues that come up. So I'd like to ask about that side of things. I think those are great questions. And I think if we um, really look back to some of the key points we were saying here today, which is that the frontline or first responders to anything related to suicide or really anything related to mental health are actually friends and family, which is everyone here. Not everyone here necessarily is a psychiatrist or a therapist or a physician or even public health worker, but everybody is family or friends to other people. And I think that's what's important. And it keeps on repeating itself in every study that we do related to mental health. When we ask 
who would you go to first? If you felt that there was a mental health concern that you were dealing with, it always comes out to friends and family first. Why am I emphasizing that? Because there is so much all of us can be doing. And I would like to draw your attention to a summary, actually, article, a kind of a brief, um, hopeful, I hope, inshallah, article that we um, wrote actually on this topic, whether it relates to suicide prevention. We kind of did, did a list of like six things friends and family can do to help with suicide prevention. It was just published just some days ago, actually, because this is September Suicide Awareness and Prevention Month. So it was just published uh, earlier uh, last week in uh, Muslim Matters. And we'll put that link for you here just very shortly. We had a link uh, to an article also on Muslim Matters on the topic of suicide postvention. What happens in the tragedy and in the aftermath of a tragedy in your community of what can you do, you know, to really help and support those who are lost survivors, those who lost a person to suicide or a whole community that lost somebody in this way. And how do you really do things well so you don't further cause harm? Sometimes we inadvertently cause harm. Sometimes our leaders and religious leaders meaning very well you know, inadvertently will say things that actually could be more triggering or traumatizing to those that have had this loss. So we also prepared this article for all of you and it's 10 do's and don'ts related to tragedy, you know, after a, a tragedy of a suicide that we can say and do. And I wanna draw your attention again to um, what Dr. Hamada was talking about, the importance of social networks and community, the importance of what happens so much about healing has to do with how the community responds and or their lack of response. It's really, really important. And this comes down to everybody as family, as friends, but especially our leaders, our imams and our ustadas and our youth leaders and so on. And this is why we have the trainings that we have, but also the steps. This is why we've written the khutbas the way we've written them. We've written the do's and don'ts to really help guide the community in what to do exactly. Because there was an earlier question there that was asked about what is it that is different about Muslims and suicide? Like what, what, what is unique here? And some of the things that are very unique that we focus on in this manual of ours is really focusing on things that are specific to the faith, like the fact that all Muslims need to have a janaza prayer, a funeral prayer for them, regardless of cause of death. They need to have the last rites of a Muslim, the, you know, the, the washing of the body and the burial of the body and the prayer for the person. And then there's all these questions about can we pray for them after their death and all of these things that come up. This is what we, why we tackled the manual the way we did, because there were so many faith-specific questions that needed to be addressed. And even our imams had questions about how do we handle this exactly, right? And how do we help the community grieve? So I hope, inshallah, you find that this work is beneficial. We're very much open to your feedback. If you look through the resources we told you about on the website and through the articles you're reading here, and you find that there's actually more that you want, you know, that, well, how about this topic? Or we're missing this? Or how do we address this? Let us know. Because that's what the whole point of the lab is. We're here to actually create uh, resources for you, inshallah, and that Maristan can then provide them to the general community. The manual sounds like a, just an incredible resource, along with the chutbahs and everything else that's been described. So I do hope that people joining us here tonight will, in fact, take a look at all of those resources. I know that some people have very specific questions about um, how to serve, how to best serve their um, their patients, their their communities, their friends and family. Um, and I hope that there are a lot of answers. It sounds like there's a lot of good answers in all these resources, in addition to what's been shared here tonight. Um, did anyone else want to, to add to that um, question on how to support in the aftermath of a, of a tragedy like that? I think one of the things that has come up a, a couple of times when we've uh, jumped in to support different communities um, are things about balancing sort of uh, faith versus um, compassion. And I think that's, that's one of the things that Dr. Rania has, has said, but I, re I really want to emphasize that a little bit more. Um, you know, right after someone has died by suicide is not really the time to bring up questions of faith. You know, that's, um, that just does more damage um, uh, to, to the, you know, the bereaved people who are, who are grieving their losses. Uh, but it's also not the time to shy away from discussions of suicide, um, uh, including discussions that suicide is haram. It's um, one of the things that we know in the aftermath of suicides is that there is something called a contagion effect, um, that particularly people who are vulnerable and youth 
uh, can actually act uh, once they see that suicide uh, has been done, that it, it sort of opens the door for them to, to ponder suicide, to uh, attempt suicide, or, or to actually take their own life. So this is actually a time where it's, it's a sensitive time for the community and one that requires uh, sort of tactful navigation so that we discuss suicide in a very, very um, frank discussion, but at the same time, maintaining a lot of compassion uh, for the family members and for the deceased uh, so that we don't unnecessarily harm someone uh, more than, uh, you know, uh, more than protecting other people. Wonderful. Um, I think I'd like to sort of pose a, a final question to each of the panelists at this point. Um, and we've talked so much today about uh, so many ways that, that we can help people uh, as an individual or as a service provider or as a community leader um, when it comes to this topic of suicide. And I'd like to ask each of the panelists for some final thoughts as we wrap up on what you think the most important or what, what is an important key takeaway um, from this research and what can we all listening to you take forward with us into our, into our lives as we, as we move on from this discussion. Um, and maybe I can start with, well, I can start with whoever would like to, to jump in. Sure, I'll, I'll start, a, uh, start us off today. Um, I, I think I, I really two, two key takeaways. The, the first one, uh, and this is probably the strongest one, as Dr. Rania said before, if you take nothing away from the talk, take this away, that suicide is 100% treatable. There are effective treatments out there and there are a number of resources. Um, and also, if you if you you know go to one therapist and it doesn't work, that doesn't mean that treatment won't work for you. Try a second therapist. Try a third therapist. Chances are that um, you will eventually uh, find someone who will uh, who will be able to work with you. And again, they will help you uh, resolve that uh, that issue. Uh, and the second key, uh, key takeaway for me um, is sort of a message of hope uh, in the face of uh, in this face of this conversation about stigma. So we do have this uh, this prevailing attitude in our communities that no one wants to talk about mental health, that it's taboo and it's not it's never going to change. Um, and five years ago, when I started uh, research on suicide in the Muslim community, I remember going to masjids and uh, and community leaders and saying, you know. Based on my research, Muslims are probably at risk for suicide. We haven't, we don't have the data, but maybe we should do something to either get the data or talk about this. And uh, basically, at that time, five years ago, no one was interested. No one wanted to touch the topic with a ten foot pole. Um, but look where we are five years from now, right? We are actually having open community conversations about suicide. We're having conversations again and again about stigma in the mental health community, uh, in the mental, in the Muslim community about mental health. And so that's, uh, that's something that I want us to take away is um, it may seem like there's a, a long way to go and there is a long way to go on er eradicating the entire stigma, but we've also come a really long way. And so I, I want us all to just take a, take a moment and reflect on that, that, that our conversations about stigma and mental health are effective and they're continuing to be effective. And the more we have these conversations, the more effective uh, they will be. And consistency when it comes to talking about mental health uh, is absolutely key. I, I think I'll go next. <laughs> um, so I just have two very brief um, points. And I think the first one is um, that I hope everyone understands that interventions should uh, include numerous support uh, therapeutics and education sessions um, over an extended period of time. And I believe that that's what we're doing here. Um, and then I think the other point is, is that no one is exempt from uh, suicide. And I, I think that a lot of times when people in their minds, they have this image of a person that is affected uh, by suicide. So this person looks a certain way, this person acts a certain way, this person comes from a specific socioeconomic background, um, this person um, lives in a certain uh, location, and so this is the prototype for someone who commits suicide. And so I, I think that, you know, the last takeaway that I would say um, is 
that no one is exempt from this permanent um, decision um, of suicide. Yeah, I mean, from my, my, my final, I guess, take home message is not so much from the research, but just um, to encourage people with my clinical and, and active clinical experience and activism is, you know, get help early. Do not wait till it's too late. Um, when you're feeling stressed, well, I, I posted psychologytoday.com. Uh, you can look for Muslim mental health professionals there. You can look for any mental health professional there. That's a really excellent resource. It's, it's, mainly U.S., I'm actually not sure if it's Canada as well. Uh, and so I would go start with that. Also, if you want to be active in your community, so you can certainly support Maristan and, and other organizations uh, as individuals. If you want to do something lo more local and you're worried about, you don't have to jump on the topic of suicide right away. You can do something with less stigma and talk about promoting wellness, promoting happiness, you know, uh, and go from a more positive perspective as opposed to, the hard, the more taboo, more difficult topics to touch. So if you want to organize it, whether it's in your, your mosque community or your third space or your college or, what, or your youth group, whatever it is, you know, continue this discussion. I mean, things, to, uh, as Bilal said, have really shifted in the last you know, five, 10, even 20 years. And so you can continue that conversation in your local community. I'll add to that that I very much agree with everything that was actually stated. And um, the work, as we mentioned earlier, is really something that we're all going to have to pitch in and do. When we talk about stakeholders, which really means, you know, people who are responsible for certain things in the community, this topic here and the of suicide and the more broader topic of mental health is actually something where each and every one of us is a stakeholder. It's not something that just the professionals need to work on. In fact, like I mentioned earlier, when we ask who is a person more likely to go to and it's friends and family is the answer. You should also know that the, that the answer for the professionals is a little bit lower down on the list. And we're hoping that it gets a little bit higher in time, but it's really important to understand that that's, that every person here is what we call a stakeholder in mental health of our communities and our families and our loved ones. So when people say, you know, what can I do to help? One of the first things to know is that you can always inspire change in someone else. And sometimes that's all about role modeling. So when we talk about other people of your friends and family, maybe your own children, or maybe there are people in your community that you serve, like youth and others, when they see that you yourself are role modeling good and positive health and really taking care of your well-being, they too are likely to do the same. I have often talked to in our trainings and trainings with imams, for example, they'll say things to me like, yes, we're starting to say to families, you should go to see the mental health professional when they, you know, they come to the imam and clearly the issue is more of a mental health issue, not a religious spiritual issue. And there are lines drawn about what, you know, who should be counseling about what, for example, right? However, I've often said to our dear imams that, you know, imagine how much stronger it is if you said to that family or the person coming to ask you the question, and I too see a therapist because I have a heavy load to carry here in the community and therefore it helps. And therefore you should as well. Imagine how much stronger that message would be. And I know, I know there's people smiling here, but trust me, there are, there are more and more imams and leaders every day who are actually seeking out this kind of support because they do carry a lot, mashallah. But this all goes to just say, start with yourself first and then your inner circle next. And then after that, the broader community, preferably the local community, before we talk about these very national kind of and the global ummah type of situations. I'll also say this, you know, having, you know, really um, having been in the after the unfortunate aftermath of helping communities pick up pieces after the loss, very tragic loss by suicide. I've done a number of what we call post-vention trainings after, you know, a suicide training of how to help the community help and grieve a number of these, subhanAllah. And what I could tell you from my experience from that, from all that work is really to know that often people, when a, when a tragedy or crisis strikes, it's just, they freeze. Like it's really hard to figure out what to do next. And this is why, you know, I hope we're not sounding redundant, but this is why we're saying, come to the resources that have been developed because it is really hard in that moment to know exactly what to do. So reach out for the kind of help. 
we hope inshallah in time that the whole big group that's part of Marist and all of our partner collaborators, we want to actually come to your communities and help train your leaders so that they know what to do when, you know, in the, in the moment where they need to intervene, so suicide intervention or even just mental health intervention, or of course, unfortunately, the unfortunate aftermath of a crisis as well. So please do know that there are resources out there. Part of education and awareness is that you play that part too in letting folks know where to turn and where to go and you yourself role modeling that kind of self-care, which is not, people hear the word self and they think of the word nefs, you know, <laughs> you know, or the word enna in Arabic, like enna, enna, this is, you know, what do you mean I should focus on myself? This is actually part of our very sunnah of taking care of ourselves first and foremost, so that we can take care of others. The very beautiful, and I'll end with this, a very beautiful Islamic um, saying is that, you know, what the scholars often say is that you can't actually give what you don't have. And a container can only pour out what it contains. So if you yourself don't have that kind of ability to give self, to, to help others, how are you going to do so if you haven't helped yourself, right? So this is where we start with ourselves first, then the ripple effect of our, you know, circles um, of our local and then our more national and then our ummah kind of communities in Shah. That's a perfect way to end this conversation tonight. Um, I want to thank all of our incredible panelists here tonight for imparting such wisdom um, and some really important tips and tools that I think we can all take back to our families, um, to our communities, and also for ourselves, um, things that we individually need to think about too. So thank you all so much, not just for tonight and and your incredible uh, wisdom, but also for the, for the really important work that you do every single day. So thank you all. I want to thank everybody so much for joining us here tonight. I hope that this is the start of a conversation and more importantly, a start to solving this really tragic um, challenge that we all face. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, you've been given some tools and tips tonight that can help us start down that path. So thank you all. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Assalamu alaikum.